that have uh, been with us through the, through the generations. I don't know when last, I don't know if ever we've been in the same room, Chris and Merrill, Rory and Mel, Ryan and Mel, and Heather and myself in the same room, the same city, same, same room, same dinner table, absolutely phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. It has been, I feel like streams have come together in one river. And then Mel got up this morning and began to sing, let the river flow. I just thought, Lord, you are flowing. Thank you for your goodness, Lord God. Really, we're celebrating 40 years, uh, not of a church legacy. We are. We thank God for our legacy and our heritage, all that God's given us through the Venants, through the Dyers, through the Matthews. We thank God for that. But really, the person that is the hero of our story is Jesus Christ. He is the one that's held us together. It's in Him that we have everything, and we owe our, owe our very lives to Him. And we, we really do honor Jesus in this moment, but we do want to take these moments to honor our relationships, and so that's why tonight we wanted to invite the city, invite church leaders to come and enjoy this moment together, and we want to honor you. So if you're a church leader, if you're on the eldership in a church in the city, please can you come to the front very quickly. If you're on eldership in the church, and, and outside the church, Ash, Nadine, any, if you're on eldership, if you're on eldership in a church, can you come to the front very quickly? That's you, McKinley, as well. There's elders here from Johannesburg, from Richmond, from Pine Town, from Durban North, from Kloof, is from Belito. Hey, Dylan, thanks for being here, buddy. There's even, there's even elders here from the Bluff. Lovely to have the Ntulis with us. We want to honor you guys. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for being friends with us. Why is there like a little bit of a, like, don't, can we just, Dil, please come and stand next to him. Come, let the link guys, please, can you come and stand next to him? Slev, please, buddy. No, they are. He's a very good looking guy. Raw, I need you. Come, come. We really do want to honor you and thank you. 40 years of friendship, partnership, we couldn't have done it without you. And we really, really do. From Anthem to Red Point, all the way across. Just thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Bryanston, all the way, Cape Town, absolutely amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And... Uh, we honor you guys. Let's, let's just give these guys a huge round of applause. Just thank you. Church on Main. Thank you. LSA. Thank you. And I, think, I couldn't think of a better person to pray for us and to strengthen and encourage us in prayer. It's our gift to you than our, my mate Rory Dyer. So that's why he's going to pray for us and strengthen and encourage us. Moses. We brought the heavy hitters down from Pretoria. So, Raw, thank you, buddy. One of my mates said he didn't want to go to heaven. I said, why not? He said, there are 24 elders there. <laughs> <laughs> and many of you I know, I've seen you grow up. I've grown up under your leadership. To wield the sword of God over the people of God year after year, is one of the most remarkable privileges we'll ever get. And I think the greatest moments I've ever had in my life with any of you has probably been on our knees as we've prayed for the action of heaven to come into the chaos of earth. And I've seen many of you men and women crying out to God on behalf of others for decades. And I want to say to you, it's worth it. I don't know what Chris and Merrill feel like at this time, 
but I think their hearts must be popping out of their chest that they knew when seven or eight or ten of them got down on their knees and said, God, would you do something with our lives? And to see this beautiful array of multicolored generosity and geniuses must be the most phenomenal thing. But you were designed for this. The Bible says the Holy Spirit called you for this. He hovered over you and designed you to become an elder of the church. You could be doing many things, but he called you to elder the church. Lift your hands. And just say this, Lord, once again, I receive the endowment of heaven to look after your people on earth, to sacrifice for them, to pray for them, to take care for them, to give an account for them, to make them healthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, guys. Bless you and thank you once again. We have a couple of family items, if you don't mind. Um, we've, got a, we've got a gift that we're showing off, like, just, we're going to see her again tonight because we just can't get enough of her. Uh, some people have heard her for, four, for the fourth time now, I think now, but, but absolutely a gift. But as Puno um, comes up and gets ready to share a poem that she's put together for our 40th, I got hold of Dudley. Daniel, who some of you will know, and he was instrumental in the early days of this church in shaping and forming and helping, particularly a young Venant leader. And uh, I said, Chris, I mean, uh, Dudley, please will you just give us a voice note and encouragement, and I'd love to play with you what he, what he sent through to us. It is classic, classic Dudley, and a real father in the faith to many, and so please enjoy this, and uh, Many of us haven't heard it before, so this is the first time we'll be hearing this, this moment. Thank you. Happy 40th anniversary, Glenridge. What a great, great milestone. Congratulations. How the years have flown, I can hardly believe it. You guys are an amazing bunch of people and much loved from many, many, many around the world. I remember those early days when we would come into that church, different school halls, uh, teach on leadership, teach on the wine and the wineskin, preparing the wineskin for the, the wine of the Holy Spirit, the hunger, the thirst, hour after hour, people saying when I, should, when I would say, should we quit, people saying, carry on, just a, such a hunger for God, and that's got right into the roots and foundation of that church. I believe that Glenridge has always been destined for, by God uh, to be a flagship church, and I believe the future for you as a group of people, God's people, will be even greater than its past. Just hold steady, keep your eyes on Jesus and continue to listen to his voice because he will steer you into more and more effectiveness into the future. So Stan and Heather, the team of elders and the faithful flock, you are all of real stars. God has his hand upon you. He will carry you on into the future, what he has for you, and it's going to be a great harvest of faithful believers. Just want to give you a few words of encouragement, things that I just feel like the Lord would have me to share with you, just a few scriptures. The first one is found in Isaiah 46, verses 3 and 4, and I'm going to read to you just parts of it from the Message Bible. But he says this, Listen to me, family of Jacob, and in your case, Glenrich, I've been carrying you on my back from the day you were born, and I'll keep carrying you when you're old. I'll be there bearing you when you're old and grey. I've done it and will keep on doing it, carrying you on my back, saving you. And so while you're not old and grey, right in what this promise is saying is that no matter how long it is before Jesus comes back, God's there for you, carrying you, helping you, and he's your redeemer. The next scripture I just want to share with you, and I hope you take note of these things, 
because I really feel God wants to speak them to you. And I'm speaking, I'm reading again out of the Message Bible from Zechariah chapter 10, and bits and pieces from verses 3 through to 12. This is what it says there. God of angel armies will step in and take care of his flock, the people of praise, the people of Judah. He'll revive their spirits and make them proud to be on God's side. God will use them in his work of rebuilding, use them as foundations and pillars, as tools and instruments to oversee his work. They'll be a workforce to be proud of, working as one, their heads held high, striding through swamps and mud, courageous and victorious and vigorous, because God is with them, undeterred by the world's thugs. God says, I'll put muscle in the people of Judah, the people of praise. I'll save the people of Joseph. And Joseph is, he will add, I know the, their plan, pain and will make them good as new. They'll get a fresh start as if nothing had ever happened. And why? Because I am their very own God. I'll do what needs to be done for them. The people of Ephraim, that's fruitfulness or double prosperity. The people of Ephraim will be famous, their lives brimming with joy. Their children will get in on it too. Oh, let them feel blessed by God. I'll set them free. Oh, how they will flourish. But my people, oh, I'll make them strong, God strong. And they'll live my way, God says so. Keep in step with the Spirit, controlled by Him and Him alone. Expect good leaders and church planters to be raised up from your midst and enlarge yourselves. I want to just read to you from Isaiah 54, 54, just from verse 2, a couple of verses there. really feel this is a prophetic word for your future. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare or hold back. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither will you be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. God loves you guys, Anne and I love you, you're a precious people, and we pray for you almost every day of our lives. Blessings on you all. God bless. old soldier of the faith, just pumping it out all the time. Puno, I met like a few days ago, a week ago. She is a gift. She is a poet. And um, Rory started writing a poem for the 40th and just felt like it got beyond him. He wrote about six words and then, and then gave, sorry, six lines. Uh, you know, wrote, you co-wrote it. I know you did, Rory. And he gave the six words to her, and then she wrote this. So Rory co-wrote this with her. Amen. You are incredibly gifted, Rory. Very, very gifted. And very proud of her, exactly. And um, so do enjoy this. This is, you can actually find her on YouTube and see many of the other things that she's written. But uh, we're actually very proud of you as well, Puna. Absolutely, phenomenally proud of you. We are... So excited that you were revealed at this moment for this occasion. You have blessed us unbelievably. And so, bless us again, please. Thank you.
40 years ago, 10 oaks of righteousness gathered, friends in the faith, brothers in arms, soldiers, eagerly awaiting the command of the Lord of Heaven's army. With a passion for freedom, the presence stirring, spurring, the presence knew that one faith-filled room would break out into hundreds of school halls, forming the firm foundations of tents. Kingdom built from the station out into the nations. This gathering formed a seedbed of leaders sprouting, yearning to yield fruit to feed friends, family, and beyond. All from the mustard sized seed that once fell on fertile ground, landing between Glenwood and the Ridge, the birth of the Glenwood dream, born from a single question Jesus, I need to know if you are real. The answer, a revelation that rolled out like a drumbeat, building, multiplying, prophesying, writing stories of generosity, people arriving bent over, then stage diving and leaving set free, cause every Sunday, words of fire spreading, blazing to the ends of the earth, 80 homes planted, Every city, every state, from Glenridge to Gazangulu, from villages to villas. Now, prayers and praise break and form solid ground. Songs of ascent bring freedom in the capital city. Faithfully, Belitandaza, placing lights of hope on the top of every city hill, sending, releasing men and women on mission, revolving doors, bringing the broken in, sending them free to declare glory. Oh, friends. How beautiful are your feet, for you have preached the gospel of peace. So I stand here today, after 40 years of servant-hearted sacrifice, to honor, to remember, to sing Psalm 40. Many will see what the Lord has done and put their trust in Him. For you have raised a generation a generation of believers, of church planters, of mothers who feed their families with grace and mercy, of fathers who defend their homes with honor, of young people who are born from a heavenly inheritance, unashamed, untamed, and ready to be released. And now the next generation waits eagerly in the wind to join you on the front lines to serve a multi-generational Jesus equipped by obedience. We the Joshua's begin to declare your kingdom come, your will be done in my city, in my home, in my life as it is in heaven. After 40 years, of many moments, we will move towards the promise together, not towards a building, but a body, anointing oil dripping down a braided beard, spirit flowing into all facets of society. So let's get our hands dirty into people's stories, deep diving and navigating the mess while taking none of the glory. This will be a place of rest and restoration. Sick souls will heal. Troubled minds will become free. Strongholds will be broken and revealed. Friendship bonds will be formed. Love expressed through faith. Orphans and widows will know that they are God's priority. Diversity will be the legacy and not the fight. All gifts will be expressed in all shades of creativity and the Bible will remain our sword and no one will forsake their identity at the door. 
and we will allow all our flavors to mingle and waft up to heaven like myrrh. So as we build this altar of remembrance, may our hearts know that we were never meant to settle here, but like Mary, be forever at the feet of Jesus. For when he moves, we are with him. Where are they going? What streets do they lead to? What doorsteps do the feet land on? What snakes and scorpions are they trampling? Then we'll begin to see whose feet need washing. Black and Indian, white and colored, foreign and local, rich and poor, educated and uneducated, saved and yet to be saved, seeking, hungry, lonely, wealthy, begging, bitter, broken, sinners, us, you, me. From 40 years of manner moments, we will go on to 40 more years of breaking bread, piece by piece, breaking of barriers, peace by peace as we feast we will become one it is a wonder what one honest question can do Jesus I need to know if you are real Today is the mark of 40 faithful years of prayer, sweat, and tears. And I stand expectant for the next generation of leaders who will blaze towards 40 years, 480 months, 14,000 days of building God's church and bringing kingdom back down. Mark's in Chris's hand. Meryl, you want to come and say hi to everybody? Please come and say hi to everybody. You'll, otherwise, you just say no. <laughs> but Chris and Meryl, 40 years ago, with a small group of people, started meeting in a, in a room and started praying with 40 people, which became the, the core of Glenridge Church. And um, we really do owe them a lot. And uh, we're very thankful for them and uh, for what they put into the life of this church. And so open your hearts. Chris carries an incredible gift to put faith in our hearts for more than the local. And I trust that he stirs us for more than the local tonight. But this is his amazing wife, Meryl. Um, Glenridge, this is the prayer that I prayed for you when this church was 25 years old, and it's still the prayer that I pray for you. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers, for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And that will be my prayer that I continue to pray over this incredible group of men and women. It is such a joy to be here tonight, celebrating all of you, incredible men and women, who said yes to God who were obedient to his call, even when it was costly, even when it was hard and dry, you've said yes, and I love all of you, and I'm incredibly grateful to be here tonight. Thank you. This is a very sacred evening. <clears throat> In fact, two weeks ago, we were up at 3CI, um, came down from Mauritius where we were landing our sabbatical, and uh, God met in a very unique way with us for two days. 
And someone asked me this evening, are you excited? And it doesn't seem the appropriate word, because this is an incredibly sacred weekend as well. Sacredness never relies on our ability to craft and shape a moment, to facilitate a worship set, or contributions, or good food, or a good talk. Sacredness is when God breaks in on us very raw, broken human beings and brings His divine presence with grace and mercy. And all that we know is that when we leave, we're different. Something has transpired. And tonight is a sacred night, dependent not on our performance, but on His divine interruption. I want to take a few moments, if I may, and give me some grace to just frame these 40 years, and then I want to go to the Scriptures and do due diligence with Philippians. Meryl and I are given disproportionate recognition for the first chapter of the story. There were a group of us who started praying together at the Anglican chaplain's house near the university. I was not the leader. In fact, we didn't have a leader. Our leader had walked out on us. But we knew there was the seed of something extraordinary. And we prayed. We didn't know what else to do. We were kids. I was 24. Meryl was 21. She was still at college, university. And so whilst we are grateful for the applause, in our heart of hearts, we know that the true culture creators were way more than us. Because if you want to understand the Glenrich worship culture, you had to have met Malcolm Duplessis. Because Mally taught us how to worship by having praise parties where one minute we were twisting again like we did last summer and the next we were on our faces in ecstatic praise and gratitude. If you want to understand the hospitality culture that has held for 40 years, you have to have known Carol now. Because Carol was with us from the beginning who took the idea of a table and led us into an extraordinary culinary adventure. If you understand the prophetic edge to this church, you have to know, and this you do, Sheena. Because I remember in the early days, we were clueless. And Sheena would say something like, you know, I've got a prophetic word from the Lord. And it was always Isaiah. And we turned to each other and say, where's Isaiah? <laughs> Isaiah. Because we didn't know, really, there was an Isaiah or Isaiah. And she would quote, and we would be ecstatic because it was always a good one. You know, we never had bad prophecies. We made certain of that because we were leaders. And we never allowed bad prophecies. We only allowed good ones. If you understand the high virtues that make Glenridge what it is, you have to know Dugger. Because when I met him as the editor of Zigzag Magazine, the surfing magazine, and he stumbled into this world, little, little did I know that I would enjoy 40 years of friendship with a remarkable man I had to send him home once because he arrived on a Sunday night as an elder with a sarong, with a skirt, and I said, will you please go home and get dressed properly? <laughs> but you see, Doug taught us virtues. He kept our feet to the flame because virtue was a high priority to him, and he kept that consistent through the generations that have led. If to understand Glenridge, you have to understand Rory. Rory was a ninth, and Mel were 19 year olds when they stumbled in. In fact, their first meeting, they ran out. And it was Kevin Jones, who was the elder on duty, who ran after them at the Glenridge School and spent the entire meeting ministering to them on the street. Little did he know, Kevin, that he was actually ministering to the very soul of chapter two in the Glenridge story. But to understand the passion we have for Jesus and the compassion, for his bride, you have to know Rory. If you understand the protective nature of what we do, particularly with our young single girls, and we had many then, and the deep love and the strength and the fortitude that was anchored in this community, you have to know Ashley Bell. Because Ashley was our go-to guy when we suspected there was a wolf. And Ash would go and he would grab someone and he would go and engage the guy and speak to him. And more than a few left the gathering because we promised Jesus we would look after his girls. And there were muscle men, and I'm talking about spiritual muscle men, who said yes and amen 
to that end. If you want to understand the thinking nature of this community story, you have to know Tomo. Because Tomo kept us in a thinking space where we were not drilled simply by the euphoric ecstasy of a life encountering the Holy Spirit, but we were true to the text. And He kept us in the text, even we who were ignorant, and we most, we were. He was probably the cleverest, besides Nigel, of the lot of us. And who can forget the prayer culture that He drilled into us, rolling His Bible up into a little ball, pacing up and down, veins sticking out of His forehead. And so I can go on. Because to truly understand our story, you have to understand those people. I was the orchestra conductor. I played no instrument particularly well, but I knew that there were great instruments in the house, and all that I had to do was find them and blend them together and let them play. And play, they did. Thank you for those who in that first watch said yes. We were truly clueless. But God was incredibly kind. But lest you think we were superstars, we were incredibly insecure. We were highly ambitious. We were very competitive. We boxed regularly. My closest friend in, in America is a guy called Terry Fouchet. And we would stand in elders' meetings, stand shouting at each other. We didn't know any better. In fact, there was a night where we still had our offices in Freer Road, where Kevin and Debbie led a meeting. I can't remember what the meeting was, but I walked in the next morning, and there was a whiteboard, and on the whiteboard was everyone's name who attended, and next to every name was either a T or a C. And so everything inside of my vulnerable insecurity shouted at me, they're going to pull a coup. And people were deciding, are you for Terry or are you for Chris? <laughs> See, don't, don't think we're superstars. We were racked with our own vulnerabilities. We were racked with our own brokennesses. And we all carried the limps of a traumatic life somewhere, somehow. And so when, Terry, when Kevin came in the, the morning and I, I said, oh, Kev, how did last night go? He said, absolutely amazingly. And I didn't quite know how to approach it. I didn't want to say to him, well, is there a coup? So I said to him, you know, oh, it must have been interesting. Oh, well, what happened here? And uh, he said, oh, well, these are all the people who are here. And I said, what was the tea or the C? And he said, well, those are the people who are going to have tea, and those are the people who are going to have coffee. <laughs> Please never think that you disqualify for a great gospel adventure. If, it, if there was disqualification on the table, it was us. And I cannot let the moment pass before we go to the text for telling you one other story, and it has no bearing or relevance except, you know, memories are incredible things. Memories are splashed with, are truth splashed with Im imagination. It never really happened the way we tell the story. I mean, we know that, doesn't it? I mean, you know, I listen to my kids tell stories about me, and I'm thinking, no, it didn't quite happen that way. But it's truth with imagination. That's a good memory. We were away at Lincoln Haven at a leadership camp, and Dugger was single, and uh, we tried to marry him off without much success. And uh, Sheena had just come back from YWAM. And so during a prophetic time, someone said, you know, why don't we pray over Sheena? So we all rallied together. And we laid hands on Sheena, and we were starting to pray over her. And someone, Dugger's hand was on her shoulder too. And someone started prophesying her marriage. And at the corner of my eye, I looked at Doug, and he ripped his hand off. He said, ace, 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 <laughs> Love you, Douglas. Love Sheena. And I am extremely curious of just how her heavenly worship is sounding right now. I wonder if you'll grab your Bibles, please, and go to the book of Philippians. And I want to take some time to walk you through this remarkable four-chaptered message. You know, we forget sometimes that letters were not commonplace in the ancient world. Only the wealthy had scrolls, and only officials in government had postal uh, passageways to get uh, messages from one place to the other. It was incredibly expensive, so most letters were just a half a page. And they, if you were 
official enough, you would put it in the system and it would get across to wherever it needs to be. And so when Paul writes these incredible letters of affection and fatherly concern, you must know it was highly costly. It cost him a packet, not only to get the scroll to write the letter, but then to find someone trustworthy enough like Epaphroditus who was prepared to take this letter, put it into his bag, and spend months getting across to where he needs to be to deliver the message. It was a highly sacred, valuable, expensive piece of literature. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, to all God's holy people in Christ. Isn't that glorious? By the law of first mention, the church is more important than the leaders. Together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. I always pray. Where are you, Paul? I'm in prison. I am shackled to a God 24 hours a day in six-hour cycles. The Roman prison had no food, no bed, no bedding. I pray for you always with joy, shackled 24 hours a day, to a Roman God, without a bed, without bedding, without food, without water. I pray for you always with joy. Because of our partnership in the gospel, your partnership, from the first day until now, Meryl said to me, please tell people, when I stumble, my Bible is racked with red. So she said, tell them that you can't always see the word there, and that's true. Being confident of this, that he who began, being confident of this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day, until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. All of you Share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ. John Tyson says this is God's fav- uh, Paul's favorite church. And this is my prayer, that the love, your love, may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me is pretty crappy. I'm in prison. And I, can I use an Americanism, and I don't mean to offend, I am pissed off. No, that's not what reads. I want you to know what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace, God, and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Heavenly Father, This has been an extraordinary weekend. I'm amazed at people's tenacity and fortitude to hang around and sit and listen to another talk. But as we were each given a little container with mustard seed, I put my container on the table, asking once again that the mustard seed of this word would find its way, burrow its way into our hearts. For those who are tired, weary, discouraged, and bitter, would your Holy Spirit come and bring about joy once again, the incredible joy of loving Jesus and loving His church. I'm not sure there is another higher joy than that. Because it's your joy, Jesus. I pray that the Word would come alive to us in unique ways. For those who are facing life-changing decisions, where should I go, what should I do, that somehow a word, a thought, an idea, a story would answer that. But most 
important of all, that we would encounter you, Christ, the redeeming Savior, to whom we can surrender our all, an empowered Holy Spirit to allow us to fulfill the Father's purpose, no more and no less. In Jesus' name, amen. Rory did such an incredible job this morning. He took us through the Ethiopian eunuch in ways I certainly have not seen. Because finding yourself in God's story is arguably one of the most important things you need to do. What do you mean by that, Chris? You, you, you are not an ad hoc Christian events, things that just happen to you randomly without real continuity of thought or understanding. It is when you take the novelty of the text and allow the narrative of Scripture to be unpacked that you find yourself, There's, that's where I am, says the 14-year-old girl who's pregnant out of wedlock. I am there. They call her Mary. My name is Amy. I see myself in there. Each one of us has moments in our lives, unfolding chapters, where we see ourselves. And finding ourselves in that moment, dear friends, is so imperative to allow grace and mercy to capture our heart one more time. Philippi, very briefly, was started by Alexander the Great's dad. When the Romans conquered it, they made it the outpost of retired Roman soldiers who had achieved much in the field. There was no tax. It was new money. It was of great political importance. There was manipulation and political elbowing all the time. There was this high sense of patriotic nationalism. And their worship was Caesar as king. Can you imagine coming in with another gospel that it's not Caesar who is king, who gave you all this wealth, gave you all this land, offered you no taxes, gave you the ultimate retirement on the water's edge, and now you come and tell me there is another king and his name is Jesus? Is it at all a wonder that there wasn't a synagogue even in Philippi because you needed 10 Jewish males to have a synagogue? There wasn't even a synagogue in town. I want to walk you through a pretty remarkable story. But I, I don't want to start in Acts 16 as is often the propensity, which is when the church was founded. I want to go just a few verses before, and I am vulnerable to an author. This is not my great idea. I think it's a great perspective. And he says the story of Philippians actually started with the parting of Barnabas and Paul. He argues that the purposes of God is always multiplication. And it's when we don't multiply that God has to scatter, separate. And he said, Barnabas started an apostolic household. Paul was running his apostolic household. And it was through that separation that God created this incredibly exquisite bride. The amazing thing too, and I suspect I'll get to it, but let me just say that now. The chaos and confusion of prophetic utterance. Please be careful not to let our interpretation of prophecy be literal. I listen to people sometimes and I think, please be very careful. Paul wanted to go north, the Spirit said no. He wanted to go south, the Spirit said no. Prophetically for someone, go west, boy. Go west. That's where I want you to be. But I'm not going west. I've got churches in the north. I've got churches in the south. I want you to plant the first church in Europe. Go west, boy. But he doesn't meet a man. He doesn't meet a Macedonian man. In fact, arguably, the Macedonian man joined him in Acts 27, where it said, Articus, the man from Macedonia, joined me. It was many years later when Articus joined him. At that stage, it was a woman. And I'm sure there was prophetic chaos in his mind saying, Lord, Lord, that's not what you said. You said a man, and now there's a woman. There's a man who called us to help, and I'm meeting a high-end businesswoman who deals with purple cloth. This is prophetic chaos. Be careful, dear friends, of literal prophetic interpretations upon which we place a timeline which is invariably wrong. And then her family. This is a cool church planting core up until that moment in time. And then the second component in the church planting core was a slave thing. That's what they called them. They were possessions. It was a slave thing. And Paul not only delivers her, but we don't know for sure. Theologians debate 
but it's possible that the slave thing joined the church planting team. Now it's not so cool. Because although she's delivered, she's a complex chick. And she's single. And she's had an identity in her prophesying, and now she is stripped of her prophecy, stripped of her income, stripped of her master. She is completely and utterly vulnerable. Welcome to the church planting team. We need people just like you. And then the jailer and his family, and you know that story. But, but you know who else was part of the team? There was a doctor. The doctor's name is Luke. Because we know in Acts 16, up until the planting of this church, he writes, they. They went there, they went there. And then he starts writing about we. 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 And then as Paul leaves Philippi, he writes again, they. A doctor stayed with a slave thing. The woman who was not married, who dealt in purple cloth, and a prison guard, and a doctor. Great church planting team. I want to walk us through just a few things, and hopefully they will be helpful. And the first thing that's of interest to us is the planting pioneer. Isn't it interesting that Paul, in all of his other letters, says, Hi, Paul, an apostle by the will of God. He doesn't say that here. He has an incredibly deep affection. It's almost like he doesn't feel like he needs to say, I'm an apostle. He just says, hi, Paul and Timothy, and, and we servants of Jesus. But I also love this. And again, this is not my thought. I am borrowing it, but I think it's genius. Have you noticed how Paul is able to adjust to whichever situation he is facing? My dear, dear leader, Please don't dig your heel in and say, well, this is who I am. People just have to accept me the way I am. I'm so sorry to hear that. It means you've shrunk your world to one dimension. When Paul was a lawyer to Rome, a warrior to Galatians, when he was a father to Timothy, when he was a builder to Corinth, and now he is an exhorter lover. He allowed the Spirit of God to adjust him as the circumstance requires. He allowed the Spirit of God to reinvent His leadership. So often we can stick at an age or a leadership role that we're comfortable with, and we limit God. What if God wants to take the lawyer and make him a lover, the warrior, and turn him into a builder? Are you, sir, ma'am, open for the Spirit of God to change you and shift you in your mind the way you think in your heart, the way you feel, in your language, the way you speak. I'm learning German because God has called me to minister more and more into Europe because I'm not in that context an Afrikaans boy who comes from Africa. I am a preacher of the Most High offering the gospel into their culture at this time, and I want to do it in a way that they can understand that God loves them enough to speak to them in their own language. And I will just throw this out for no real comment. Please be honest with your exegesis about our partnership in the gospel. This is not a bunch of peers doing things together. Please don't use that. You, you, can, you can be a bunch of friends and peers doing things together, but that, don't use this verse. Because this verse is about an apostle who planted a church, and that church continued to walk with him. That's what this is about. It's a beautiful passage. It's a passage of high camaraderie and sacrifice. It's a story of deep affection and prayers with joy. Okay, number two. Thank you for being so gracious. What about the planting people very quickly? Paul says of them that they were holy. Two little S's to help us remember it. The one is sacred and the other is separate. Sacred meaning that we are so compelled by the beauty, wonder, and mystery of Jesus that we want to be with Him and be like Him. And when that computer finger hesitates to draw us into the world of surreal, sexist fantasy, we are immediately detracted because we are encountering Jesus who made those women beautiful and in His image, not objects of lust for our momentary effects, uh, pleasure. Because Jesus is way more compelling than a brief sexual fantasy moment. 
a holy people, a sacred people, a people compelled by the beauty and wonder of who Jesus is and the humans that He created. But a separate people, a people who are distinctively different. Please hear me. A people who are distinctively different. I, I like you. I mean, everything I say here, I've done, so I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. But I too have said, we're going to be radical for Jesus. And, and, you know, and you stand up in front and you lead the charge. And... But when they look at my marriage, I'm different. We're different. 43 years later, we're different. When they look at your kids, look at the dire kids, not to embarrass them. They're different. This is separate. This is other. It's not the pursuance of the things that culture requires us to do and be as parents. Get ourselves into debt because that's what you do. No, no, no. We are the other. We rather than get into debt to give our kids what we think they want, we actually invite them into a journey of faith. Come. Come on a journey of faith with us. When we first planted the community, we had two youngsters. They're still with us. They were just out of college, 22, 23 each. And we were planting. We had no money. We had no church backing us. We had, we had nothing. And uh, we had a moment. Uh, and, and Sam is beautiful. I love Sam. From the age of 12 to 17, she was homeless, lived on a street. Her mom was an alcoholic. Her dad was a hero and addict. And Tyler, Tyler's dad died of an overdose when he was 12. He left the home when he was 6, died when he was 12. Doesn't understand fathers, fought me at every turn. It was a moment because we had to pray money in. I mean, that's just like the building fund. We had to pray money in. And I thought, you know, it's no good if I pray money in and have all these great stories to tell. So I, I called them in on the Tuesday, and I said, guys, this is our financial situation. Okay. So we're about $5,000 short. Yep. So I said, what should we do? I, I knew what they were going to say. And I said, well, why don't we ask Jesus to make it? When should we ask Jesus to provide $5,000 for now, remember, you're just out of college. You've got $100,000 debt. $5,000 is impossible. And they said, well, Friday? So it's Tuesday. I said, good. Yeah. All right, we trust God for $5,000 for Friday. Friday comes by, and all the money that comes into the Genesis account, because we haven't had accountants or anything, comes to my email. $5,000 has come into the account. But I don't recognize the name. So I email the person. I say, look, actually, you've sent it to the wrong account. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. Would you send it to this one? Oh, by the way, who are you? You know. And he sends an email back. He says, my son is at university at Biola, and he's been part of your church and the ministry of Genesis. My church, how horrific. The ministry of Genesis has changed his life. I just want to thank you. Here is $5,000 for us. I, Yeah. We could have gone into overdraft, we could have done whatever. And I was able to call them and say, Ty, uh, Sammy, do you want to come around? What do you see? $5,000. Not more, not less, 5000 What day is it? It's Friday. What do we pray on Tuesday? See, that's the gift we can give our kids. Not spend, 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 spend. Invite them into a journey of faith and let them see that we are the other people. We are the ones who trust God and see and watch his uh, work done. All right, I'm running, I'm doing, going way too, too slowly. Uh, chapter 2, please. Chapter 2. I want to just read an exquisite passage of Scripture. This is theologically called the Common Christi. A new the theologian I'm really enjoying, a guy called Nijay Gupta, an Indian brother, uh, says this is the ode to Jesus. It's a poem. It's probably an anthem they sang that Paul cut and paste into his writings. And it says this in chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. 
He helped himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue uh, acknowledge, thank you, that just so many lines. And Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Obviously, we can exegete this at length. When we lose our love for Jesus, we lose our love for the church. It's simple. See, I, I really don't mind what's happened to you. I had faced two lawsuits in L.A. I had to sit in a Los Angeles court of law having people lie about me. I've had men walk up to me and say, we will destroy you. And so the list goes on. Now, if my love for Jesus died, I would have been as mad as a snake, bitter, angry, resentful. See, please don't blame the church. It's the decision you've made to get wounded. And I was lying in the fetal position. I got out the shower when the sun was up. The sun was down, and I was lying on the floor in my bathroom crying out to Jesus. And I said, Jesus, please. Let me never stop loving you, no matter what the church does to me. Because Jesus is magnificent. He is glorious. He is redeeming. He ransoms. He, he, he brings us into a, a new life of intimacy with the eternal Father. But when that goes, I listen. Oh, I can't believe the way the leaders treated me. No, no, Jesus is the apostle and the high priest. Jesus is the great redeeming king. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Can I speak with a broken heart to those of you who've walked a long time and whose soul has been bruised and you feel it's been incredibly difficult? It's Jesus. That's all. That is all. It's all about Jesus, when our heart is tweaked by affection for Him and our lips are filled with songs of praise and our hands are lifted heavenward in glory and in gratitude, then the church is a magnificent bride. I walked my two daughters down the aisle and I gave them away. And in that moment, I did not remember the times they lied, cheated, were dis devious. When they were dishonored, I didn't remember a thing. I was walking an exquisite woman down the aisle, and my task is to prepare this bride for that moment, and I will walk you down the aisle again. <laughs> Beware of anything else. I can tell you all the things that we've made something else. Leadership. Oh, Sundays I preach leadership. I'm so embarrassed I said that. I oh, know we're about the model. I'm teaching the model. No, I did that. It's about Jesus. I, I mean, I can carry on. Okay, number four. I'm, I'm trying to rush to end because I want to get to the last one. An ecosystem. A pioneering founder, planting people, Jesus, an ecosystem. You know, it's beautiful. There are five, let me just one, two, three, four, five names mentioned here. Every one of them became a bishop. Timothy became the bishop of Ephesus. Epaphroditus the bishop of Philippi, Clement, from which we get the word clemency, mercy, was the bishop of Rome, arguably the second or third pope. Artemis was the bishop of Apamea, Titus, the bishop of Crete. Because when you are in an apostolic household, leaders emerge. Even if you preach badly, leaders emerge. Even if you do a poor job, Leaders emerged. They hang around Paul, and they became bishops. Now, you might be saying, well, Chris, I'm not one of those guys, well, or gals. Well, let me tell you about Luke, who was a doctor, who never became a bishop. But he wrote with great scientific elegance a gospel that described detail that was extraordinary, that hung around to help out in the Philippian Church, let me tell you about Luke. Let me tell you about Caesar's household. They were never called 
out to go and plant churches. They were nestled into the very power and authority of the world in which they lived. And into that place, they had to offer the gospel in a sneaky and subservient way to let people know there is another king who is not Caesar. Let me tell you about them. They were born into an ecosystem that validated that journey. Let me tell you about the two women whose names I can't pronounce. Udia and Sintajim. Well, we know that they were co-workers with Paul. We know that they contended at Paul's side and fought for the gospel in prayer. We know that they were remarkably gifted, but the thing that we will always remember is that they quarreled. You know what's interesting is Paul doesn't even tell you what the quarrel was about. He just says, for heaven's sake, get over yourself. My dear friends, we make things that we quarrel about as if it has eternal significance. You ignored me. You didn't invite me to your party. Your perspective. You prophesied. You, dear friends, it's not even worth putting in the Bible. Stop fighting. You are gift, Paul says, to co-work with me apostolically. You are gift to contend with me for kingdom advancement. Now, stop it. Now, create an ecosystem of unity, of partnership, of honor, of respect, of applause, of appreciation. Let's create that eco set, and I close with this. Joy. Joy. Why, Jesus was mentioned 36 times. Christ, actually. 36 times in four chapters. You tell me that Christ is kind of important. Joy. Five times Paul speaks about joy. Can you turn with me, and this is my final scripture with my closing comments, please. To Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. I think it's going to pop up on the screen. Not that I've, I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. But I press on. End well. Press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, brothers and sisters. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. One thing I do. Joy for me, if I may be as bold as to say, is directly connected with one thing. Now this is what I think we need to understand. Think of one thing as the central... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, grapes have a? Okay. Think of the one thing, the vine, that God has called you to give life. But think of all the grapes that your one thing requires you to walk through. Why could Paul worship with joy in prison? Because his one thing was to preach the gospel. And Ananias said, you will suffer in, uh, at the hands of kings he was prophetically told, you will go to prison, and you will go to prison often, and you will die. That, dear Paul, is the grape attached to your vine, and he says, I got it, hallelujah. What we do is we want sometimes that one thing. Oh God, I want meaning in my life. Oh God, I want to know what you asked me to do. And then the grape cluster comes with it. Oh geez, I don't want that. No, no. My joy is gone because look at what people have said. Look what people have done. Instead of saying, part of my vine is a grape cluster of suffering, of heartache, of pain, of celebration. This is a moment in 40 years, but I can tell you there were other moments. And joy comes when I embrace that one thing and the grapes that are attached to that vine, and I too can worship Jesus in, what's your prison? What's mine? A God gift. A God requirement. Joy comes when I embrace the vine and then the grapes that are attached to that vine pulse in my bosom. And I'm in prison. And people have been unjust to me and unkind to me and said horrible things, etc. But I am not chained to the prison warden, I'm chained to my one thing. We know an earthquake ripped the prison doors. 
We know an angel can rip the prison doors. So it's not the prison doors that's holding me captive. It's my one thing. And my dear friends, I would love to say, find meaning in your life. Find that one thing. I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. But here is the good news. With that one thing comes a cluster of grapes that we walk with gratitude and grace in worship to King Jesus that he has found me worthy to have that cluster of grapes attached to my one thing. Meryl and I love Jesus passionately more than ever. We love the church deeply. She is exquisite. In the dark years, my dark years, God gave me the gift to be able to be in a 12 people in a lounge to 6,000, standing before service after service after service, preaching. She is beautiful. She is exquisite. The eunuch... Well, the New Testament eunuch is preparing the bride for someone else. My great cluster, Jesus, here's your bride. As I wipe away her snot and her blood and her tears and her heartache, I have joy in my heart because I live in the power of that one thing. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to hand back to Stan, but I'm going to ask for the privilege to pray for you. If this is Glenridge is your home church, would you just raise your hand? I'm not looking. It's not important. Father, I thank you for the men and women who have said yes to a journey putting, being put in this ecosystem. With warts and all, but this ecosystem, this is where they will get life. This is where they will nurture. This is where they will grow fruit. This is where they will be ready to be plucked and to sent into foreign shores. This is their ecosystem, and they have said yes. For those who have drifted away, who are finding themselves dragged out by the drought of another ecosystem, bring them home. Bring them home to find the life and power and presence of Jesus here. Thank you for everyone, the little boys and girls running around here, the moms shushing them as they stick another sandwich in their mouth. Thank you for the single girl who's desperate to be married. Thank you for the, the young man who just cannot get a job and is crying out at the door of grace. Please get me a job. Please thank you for their fights, their contending. Thank you for their yes. Bless them and keep them. And may your face shine upon them. And for the rest of us, we are so honored to be set aside by you to be a holy people on mission, a sacred and separate people to your glory and to the kingdom advancement in Jesus' name. It's a wonderful 40th celebration coming to an end. At the end of it, there's one thing. There's one person. And I trust out of all of this, we all take home with us, no matter what church you come from, the one thing and the one person. The person of Jesus, if you do not know Jesus and you're standing here tonight, I want to tell you, you need to call on his name. He will become your one thing. And when you call on his name, he will reach out to you and he will save you. He'll restore you. He will forgive you. He'll wipe you clean. Cleaner than you know. 
you've walked away from Jesus, there's one thing waiting for you to return. Don't leave here tonight without making right before God. Don't leave here tonight without making right before people. Father, we thank you for 40 years of history. We thank you for 40 years of pursuing the one thing, the one person. Help us to do that for another 40, Lord. I won't do it. Somebody else will. Father, help us to raise up another generation that will fall in love with the one thing. Help us to raise up another generation that will take that one person to the outermost parts of the world. That will take that one person to their neighbor. That will take that one person to the nations, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. We honor you and we thank you. Bless you. And bless these people. Thank you for our friendships. Thank you for our partnerships. Thank you for our friends. Thank you for our family. We honor you for it all, Lord. We thank you for it all. We are blessed. We are blessed in your mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. There's coffee on the go. There's meals for sale. Don't go without connecting with somebody. If you need prayer, please come forward. We'd love to pray for you. And uh, until next time, bless you guys. Thank you.